I know a lot of you have asked about what we're, what we're going to do uh, as we hopefully start life starts to return to normal. So what we are going to try uh, is July next month is normal. So uh, we'll stay on Zoom completely for next month. Uh, and then in August, we're going to be working with the students of the MA Arts and Place Programme at Dartington, the new Dartington College. Um, and uh, that will be live and online. And then I think we're going to try and continue in that vein from there on. So we'll have a live element and an online element. And we'll try and um, make that as interesting as possible for everyone, because it can be quite difficult to do to do the hybrid thing, um, but we will give it our best shot. So I think we are, uh, there are still people coming in, but I think we're basically there, but I want to make sure we don't run out of time. So Joe, I'm going to hand over to you and uh, Joe uh, Callahan, is that what you decided? Yes, uh, from Morton Wood. Um, uh, please do use the chat to ask questions. And then I will forward those questions um, or ask you to ask them. Or uh, at the end of a session, if you want to ask a question, just put your hand up. Um, or even better yet, use the uh, reactions uh, icon to raise your hand because I can't see everybody on the screen now. All right, Joe, sorry, over to you. OK, hi, everybody. Um, it's really great to be here. Uh, I'm a student at uh, Hereford College of Art and my uh, research proposal is looking at um, gesture and pattern and movement in the woodland and I'm just going to share my screen and talk to you a bit about that. So back in 2007, I moved into this woodland in Herefordshire and lived completely off grid. And so my whole artwork is really informed by my life there. It's a, a life that's rigorous, daily toil, just for the basic necessities of life, because we're completely off grid. And um, we're also working to restore what was a plantation back to ancient woodland. Um, so, um, we, uh, we had no, we had very little money, and if we needed anything, we had to make it ourselves and everything. So it was just a lot of hard and grueling, physical, unending work, um, and I loved it because um, it was a, uh, it brought my whole life, it transformed my whole life into a really necessary and direct engagement with the natural world which were an, on a life of absolute sensitivity to the needs of the woodland ecology we were living in and totally dependent on. So it felt like a very real relationship with the world and um, which is what many of us are searching for and you know, feel is necessary for the purposes you know, of survival of our species on this planet. But uh, so my artwork was really based in that and it was very process based. So it was all about looking at the natural materials around and processing them in order to be able to use, uh, use them for art, for art making. And that was kind of really replicated our, our traditional relationship with the past and brought that, brought that, brought those, that history of working on the land and needing natural materials in order to survive. It was all about process and that engagement. And then last September, I started the MA at Hereford College of Art and my research was all, became really embedded in that and started looking at it very closely. I feel like my life and my work and um, the art that I produce is, is, has got many connections with the past, with traditional work and with the future because of the work we're doing from the woods and with modern traditional, I mean, modern uh, workers on the land, the sort of new emerging growth of sustainable land working, the Land Workers Alliance and La Via Compatina. 
And I, um, I was very interested in the way trace and pattern and shadow were created and embedded in the landscape around us and were still being done, being embedded um, by the movements and gestures of the workers and um, uh, of people who relate to the land in the past and now. So I decided to really focus in on movement and I, I invited an, an, a dancer to come in and look at the movements in the wood, the movements that we were making as work and also the movements of the natural uh, ecosystem of, um, of the trees and the birds and everything that was going on in the wood in terms of movement and gesture and pattern. So this is Will, who's from a Two-Face <laughs> Dance Company, which is a, a local uh, dance company, but it's nationally renowned. It's based in Herefordshire. It's an all-male dance company. And he came and we, together we collaborated and talked about responding to the, the land, to this land of the woodland that we were restoring. He, um, I invited an, a, a photographer in as well uh, called Emma Drabble, who helped, uh, who documented the process because again, it was a very process-based thing. Um, and here she also filmed us and this is a film of, of Will dancing. Just, just to tell everyone that the, the film will look terrible on Zoom, but we'll put it on the online version. In fact, Joe, I don't think it's playing at all. Oh, isn't it? Oh, it's playing for me. Sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. I, the, oh, you know, we I'll, can't see it, but it's very, it is playing, but it's not very readable. Okay. I'll stop uh, it there then. I'm anyway. happy to put it up on the website if, if the yeah. company's all right with that. Okay. Thanks. So he was, um, so sorry, their will was dancing in response to the sounds in the woodland and uh, so he was listening to the birds and the bees and the insects and then a plane that came over and one of the things about the image I think is that it creates this very immediate response as to how beautiful and how idyllic that that looks but he fell in the nettles and got stung and he was bitten by mosquitoes and as I said a, bird, a, a plane came over so there was embedded in that video a lot of more nuanced and complex uh, examples I suppose of our relationship with the natural world that it all looks lovely but when we get out in there it can be very very difficult risky and um, complex. And one of the things as well that I did was I recorded sound because the three of us collaborated together, Emma, Will and I, and we, we all kind of did our separate things. I drew, Will danced, Emma photographed. I did some photographing and filming as well. And um, it was actually when we came together and discussed it that it felt like the collaboration really took off. We really kind of shared our ideas. So this is just some of the things that the, one of the things the dancer said, you know, I haven't played with the ground. It's an amphitheater and you can see if this zoom, that is the gesture of the ground and this is the movement and it is just following a continuous thing that actually is a flowing thing. Yeah, I'll investigate, Ooh, yeah. And so Will danced for 20 minutes and Emma filmed him and I watched and drew. This is a little excerpt I took from a, a, a story that I have written about the experience. It's part of my sort of understanding of what was going on was to, to write it because I was really interested in the oral history of it and listening to the audio from that. Uh, so this is a, a photo of Will dancing taken by Emma. Again, another lovely image because it shows that transitory movement through the landscape, I think, which was something I was very interested in. And here is another one. I love that. It's just almost, he's almost not there, but he, and obviously he's not there anymore. But so this whole process of our interaction with the land, this sort of transitoriness of it was something that was really interesting to come out of these photos of Emma's. And here are some of my drawings that I took as he was dancing just directly in the woodland. 
and all the marks, it was really, I used charcoal that I'd made in the wood as well, which was really, really nice. Uh, and again, this is another image about, you know, the beauty of the woodland and that in the way we respond with straight away to a, a sort of an idyllic idea of nature, which is something that I'm really interested in trying to explode and explore that there's so many images on Facebook and across social media that make nature look lovely and that it's as though it's an easy and simple thing to create this connection. Another, this is another thing from what that Will said, um, which was, I think I was making a language throughout the whole time and the language would change depending on, like there was this whole vroom and there was this whole bit. So there have been clear moments that I've had that have, ah, oh, sweet, if we had to stick something in, like make the work type thing from my bit of like, ah, if I was to make a work, then this is the research that I would do. And this is the movement language I would get out of it. And there is clear movement languages that are coming out of, out of this. And that was so exciting to me to, he to hear that when I listened to the audio, that he, he was saying that the, the move, there was a clear movement language coming out of the work that we were doing together in the woods. And uh, I asked him if he had, um, well, because partly because it, it resonated again with the whole oral histories and also because it was a physical gesture and movement, which again, those two things, I'm really trying to bring them together in my artwork. So I asked him over the, we had two days to do this, if, if there was um, any movement, particular movement that came out of it that he could, uh, would be interested in sharing or notice that he was making a lot of frequently or in response particular to the space that we were in, the place of the Morton Wood. And he did, at the end, he came to me with this movement that was here, and I'm hoping this will play. Is this playing? Mm, yes, yes. So this was a movement from Morton Wood, and it is a, I think it's a beautiful movement. It shows the relationship of everything in the woodland with the ground and with growth and how it's constantly returning to the ground and coming back into growth. And the, the reason he said that the elbows were always touching, you were always touching your elbows, you were never letting go, was to show that relationship with everything. Nothing was separate. And I'd, that was a wonderful result for me from the woodland, from the whole project. And, and then here is another bit of the discussion from the audio afterwards. Um, he stopped and told us about the difference dancing in these two places in the woods, how the place we had been before was a serene place of, whoa, wonder. In this place, he said, I had things in my head of this whole, like using the trees to support, to support me. And if I didn't have them there, I wouldn't be able to do what I could do. Yes, we said. And then, Will went on, there was this circle of life spinning, growing, decaying, breaking, back up, trying again, trying again, no, not quite succeeding thing. Yes, this spinning up and down was literally, was literally me going, the circle of life, the circle of life, the circle of life, the circle of life. So I'm just going to stop.
screen sharing there. And um, have I stopped stream screen sharing? Has that so. stopped? Yes, you have, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we can't see you now, though. Okay. We're getting your video back on. There you are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. So um, the whole circle of life thing was was really uh, a wonderful idea, obviously, and I really liked it that he wasn't particularly uh, somebody who spent a lot of time in the natural world. So it was really nice that he kind of got the whole that everything was a community that came together. But um, one thing that I really noticed from listening to the audio and watching the films that Emma had taken and looking at all the photographs and the drawings was that we each three of us were interpreting the land for each other um, in our own very specific ways. And that we would, what we were doing was interpreting. It was like none of us were naturally there we weren't native speakers, we were interpreting. And so this whole project, what was interesting for me about the whole project was that ra rather than kind of un great, getting greater understanding of a closeness with nature, that it, it just seems to me that we've, that we, what I un began, began to understand was that the separateness is constant, that we're not there, that there's so much going on that we can't understand, we can't interpret, we can't explain or we try and explain in our own individual ways, but that we are not fully part of it, that that connection is very, very difficult actually, and if not impossible, which was quite a poignant thing to come out of it for me because of, because of my understanding that I had this close relationship with, the, with the natural world through my life and the way I live in the woods. But I'm still, you know, it's still ongoing. It's very recent. Uh, so I'm still exploring and discovering what is happening from that work. I'm still drawing and looking and bringing things together. So it's just, a kind of, it's ongoing and it's, it's just a fascinating and interesting thing that I'm carrying on with. Well, that's perfect because that's five. You've got five more minutes, Joe. So uh, we've got some lovely comments coming in on the chat. Uh, quite a lot of them about your uh, the kind of language, uh, as physical language and the actual language, and your transcriptions. So um, if I can, I'm just going to invite uh, at random one person who's talking about that. So that's Janet, Janet Harper. Would you like to come in and just um, say a little bit more about? What you were thinking? Are you, yeah, are you there? No, not going to come in. All right. Uh, or not, never mind. How about uh, uh, Wendy? I was talking about movement relation to the woodland. Okay. Hello. Can you oh, hear me? Yes. Great. Sorry. Yes. I wasn't sure where the controls were. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I thought uh, the photographs of the of Will actually in movement in the forest, so he was or in the woodland, so that he was there but not there, kind of um, encapsulates what you're saying about that we aren't a part of nature as such, but we're we're related, but we're passing through it, and um, to do with respecting it and not enforcing our position in it or our place in it, but allowing it to be there for us. I don't know if that if that makes sense or not. Yes, yeah, that does make sense. Yeah, that's definitely what I was trying to look at. Uh, I mean, for me, it's been a really difficult, I mean, I described very briefly the difficulty of living in the woods and being off grid. Uh, it's been so deeply rewarding and uh, very, but yeah, very difficult. And so the whole of my artwork is trying to explore that difficulty and counteract some of the images that we have of either you can't do it at all and we should all live in high rise flats in London, whatever, with loads of screens to manage our understanding of the world, or this lovely idea of it that actually 
the reality of it is very rewarding, but it's very complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that transi transitionary nature of our passing through, yeah. Mm, I think that encourages respect rather than, as you say, yes. this, this cosy image that we're now being given after COVID, you know, that everyone's got to suddenly relate to nature and be in nature mm. as though mm. that's all we have to do. But we, we have to do a lot more than that, don't we? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 okay. it's a, just a very difficult thing, like any relationship, really. It's not just all lovely, lovely mm. wedding photographs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Peony, would you like to come in with your um, comment about um, presence and um, that? Well, I'll let you. I'll let you ask your question. I, I was merely wondering if it was the fact that there were other humans there that prevented you from being more at one with nature, and that if you were just on your own and dancing on your own, or or some other way, that you would feel more at one with nature. Oh, that's a really interesting question. Yeah, I'm, that's yeah. Um, it certainly did affect yeah my relationship with nature because I do. I do. I I did feel very at one with nature normally when I'm alone in the woods or just with my partner in the woods. But I think actually, although they were there and that affected it, it it, it more it was more that it highlighted something for me that I had not paid attention to because they both brought different ways of looking at the woods that I hadn't even pay, thought of. So, um, so for example, Will's response to the ground. I mean, I'm walking on the ground all the time, but him making gestures about the ground just really revealed it to me in a new way, I think. And the first thing he did when he came in, because my whole interest was movement and gesture. I was thinking I'd bring this dancer in and he will respond to the movements of the wood. But his very, very first thing he said was that he was going to respond to the sounds, which obviously is very makes much sense when you're a dancer, much more sense when you're a dancer. But it was not again something that I hadn't thought of, although it seems very obvious now. Uh, and so that made me re-listen to the sounds that are part of my daily life in a new way. So although I feel quite at one with nature on my own. In the woods having other people there made me realize that no there were whole areas that i was just not paying attention to in that kind of one relating way so I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna jump in there um, to because our time is up on that one um there's lots of interesting stuff in the chat as as uh, I, as i failed to say at the beginning the chat will be saved uh as will the recording from this session and be added to the website. So Mary, Mary Waltham, I'm going to welcome you uh, again, because you were one of our high water contributors as well. So it's great to see you again. Um, and um, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming everyone. And um, thanks to art.earth for the opportunity to talk about one ongoing body of work on Saxon ponds in Selborne, Hampshire where I am now. Um, my background is in biology and after a career in science publishing, I find my interest is in exploring the landscape as it highlights environmental issues. I want to bring fresh awareness to ongoing environmental degradation, especially climate change. So I'm preaching to the choir here, I know that. The opportunity to communicate visually about a major issue of our time is really what excites me. And I'd like to start with a quote that was in a, a major newspaper in the past week from one of my favorite actors, Mark Rylance. You may have seen it. I feel like we've got to fall in love with nature again. We do incredible things each for each other when we fall in love. We've been encouraged not to love animals, not to love plants, in order to enable us and others to be heartless about them and treat them as products and commodities to be used. And that's not working. And I like the fact that he's prepared to speak out like that about something which I'm sure we all care about. I'm going to share my screen now, Richard. And uh, here we go. Right, That's fine. so why ponds? 
Well, ponds are a common feature of the landscape and um, there are many around Selborne and indeed many villages and towns are there because there was a reliable pond. In early human settlements, they were a shared water resource for humans and animals. Ponds in woods and pastures are not connected to each other or to other bodies of water. They're only fed by rainwater or groundwater. And before water could be piped or pumped as now, and especially on areas of common land used for grazing livestock, ponds were absolutely essential. What started for me as a search for my own way of expressing ponds visually during what would become a drought evolved into a much deeper consideration of the cultural history of ponds, especially some Anglo-Saxon ponds near me here. Just a reminder that Anglo-Saxons were pagan initially and dominant from about 450 to 1066, that is from Roman times to the Norman conquest. Chris Webb, our local National Trust head warden, was a key source of deep, long-term local knowledge about the ponds around me, including numerous books and text references and his own master's thesis. Through Chris, I discovered that several of the ponds I had been visiting in Selborne were probably Anglo-Saxon or before, that is eighth or ninth century pre-Christian. And I wanted to create a body of work that communicated with a broad audience, that is always my goal, and asks questions of the viewer. I integrate some texts to give some background to the work, to clarify the ubiquity and utility of humble ponds over hundreds of years, and how they're so much part of our landscape. Here's one. When you approach one of these small enclosed bodies of water set into the land, you might see it as a mirror reflecting the sky or as a gap in the landscape, maybe almost a hole in the earth, an entrance to the unknown. It's Kurt Jackson. There is a sense of mystery there, sometimes dark and apparently bottomless and full of beasties sometimes silver echoing the light of the sky above with birds flying through it. No wonder these places became associated with the old stories and tales, as well as being used as places of offering in prehistoric times. They're both a magnet for life and a home to the, a world of their own. The paintings and photographs I've produced touch on aspects of fault ponds that I have found compelling. This is one of a series of watercolor paintings on transparent media, layering two paintings over each other. I want to explore the luminosity and mystery of ponds, peering down from dry land or up to the surface from underwater if you were a tadpole. Some of the layered watercolours feature organisms frequently living in ponds that you may discover as a child or an adult when you look closely. I was really after the teeming with life feeling with, of ponds. Then there's the whole naming of ponds. The old English word mere dates from around from before 900 AD and it's linked to Latin, German, French, meaning lake or pond and use of mere for a pond predates the use of the word pond. Pond's only been used since about the 14th century. So I set about uh, trying to produce another series of paintings, the mere series and my attempt to bring together color and texture, incorporating landscape materials, in this case, mud with paint. Now, ponds were often lined with clay and um, flints were then placed on, on top of the clay to protect it from being punctured by cloven hooved animals coming to drink. Flint, flint is readily available around here. It's formed from deposits of silica around marine organisms, 
when seawater covered southern England. Silica is a glassy form of sand that, like glass, fractures, and as you know, was also used as a tool. No two flints are the same. So there have been a number of very dry summers, especially summer 2018. The ecosystem of each small pond includes plants and animals that rely on it, and these become especially threatened. There are documents from 1250 describing permitted drinking rights at two ponds that are still very much in existence today. This is partly translated Old English, so it's a bit difficult to plunder through, but these ponds are still around. They're clearly ancient landscape features. Conversations with Chris Webb and subsequent reading around started me into a narrative about as, as to what would happen during a drought. I was looking for, an idea, for some concepts for installation work on site at one of the ponds. I started to document changes in the water levels of Wood Pond on Selborne Common. And you can see what was happening as the weeks went by and there was no rain. Many cultures across the world believed that bodies of water provided access to another world of spirits and ancestors. We don't know what Saxon farmers of Selborne would have done under threat of drought conditions, but other pre-Christian cultures probably would have sent a message to the spirits that they turned to about the lack of water. Now runes are letters in an alphabet used before the Roman alphabet was adopted in Britain. I looked up the Anglo-Saxon rune for water, which I think is pronounced lagouche. When the summer drought was at its peak, I made a number of lagouche-like forms from wood. Here they are, um, pre-installation, all sorts of odd shapes and sizes, but roughly conforming to that shape. I then took them to one of the Saxon ponds and installed them there near the edge. Well, within two days, it started to rain and the pond filled up. Of course, the rain wasn't caused by my runes, was it? In exploring uh, what Saxon farmers in Selborne might have done in response to drought, I asked, what action do we in the 21st century have in our power to do in the face of drought, flood, and our changing climate? And the purpose of this work so far, I'm trying, I'm attempting to draw viewers into the simple, familiar life of a pond, perhaps explored in childhood, and to consider at a different level how the fate of ponds is part of the global cycle of water, flood and drought, that's such a part of environmental degradation. Thank you very much for listening to that brief presentation. I'm very interested to hear any comments or feedback on the work, any thoughts, any ideas how I, I can move this forward. I have some ideas, but I'm always on the lookout for good discussion. Thank you, Richard. Thanks, Mary. Um... I'm going to unshare your screen you. so that we're back to uh, everybody. Um, I'm uh, I'm really struck because it's something I'd never thought of before. Uh, having lived in California, where water was absolutely uh, a source of great contention, I'd never really thought about communities in England that where the, their only source of water was a natural pond that of course right. would dry out. Do you, I mean, do you know from the research you've done how uh, how typical it was in summer for the ponds to, for ponds to dry up or does it depend a lot on you know where the where the water comes from and so on? It's interesting. I think uh, there's a lot of books written on this discussion of dew ponds up on the downs and so forth. And one of the things that Chris showed me up on Selborne Common, by one of these ponds, 
was how he believed the land had been excavated in order for water, drops of water to flow downhill towards a pond. I think it was absolutely critical. There was nothing else that you could do unless you were going to bring your animals back into the village and you know try and find some other source. But it, it must have been, it would have been terrifying to have had a drought and have had animals up there that you could not, you could not provide water to. They they would have died. Mm. But yes, California is another good example. Actually. Yeah, well, well, exactly. Uh, Selby, uh, would you like to uh, come in? And, and you talked about the word Mia as being a rather beautiful word. Isn't it? Yeah. Hi. Hi, Selby. Hello. Mary, thank you. That was really inspiring. I feel like there's layers to this. I love the the sacredness of of placing these um, these runes, these sticks to honor the water. It just feels like um, there's something about the water being seen, where the water's like an eye for the rest of the cosmos. There's something about the water being seen by you. Um, and I love the fact you go, I'm sure it's not me, but somewhere I think the appreciation of these spaces gives the beings or whatever live there such validity. It's, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I really, I really love it. When I saw them up against the wall and then I see, I already can picture them and I just feel like it's like returning water back to a sacred place again. Thank I really you. Enjoyed it. And I love the name of Mir, it's, it's so much, it's so much more honest to what water is than a pond, which seems a bit... So lots, lots of inspiration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Selby. Um, uh, there, again, Mary, there are lots of comments in the chat that you can look at Good. afterwards. And um, if the sharers today would like to put their emails into the chat, bearing in mind it's a public space, uh, people can contact you that way. Lovely. Um, and I'm easily found online. Anyway. Okay, well, that's a good alternative too. Uh, thank you. And, um, so I want to say thank you and uh, hand over to Camilla, who I have known for a long time and uh, is always doing wonderful work. Uh, so, um, Camilla, over to you. Thanks, Richard. Um, and thank you. Oh, whoops. Yeah. Sorry, Camilla, that was me. I pushed. I pushed the wrong button. Here we go. You're right. You're back. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, I was just saying thank you to Mary and Joe for those like great talks. That was really really interesting, um, and I was really struck particularly by uh, the overlap. Hopefully, that will uh, be between my work and um, what Joe was talking about in her interest in trace and pattern and shadow. Um, and embedding in the landscape that are embedded in the landscape by movement and looking at gesture, um, because that's really where becoming um, the project that I have been working on has sort of gone in that direction. It started off as as sound predominantly, and has moved into sort of movement and gesture and uh, mark making. But I'm going to just share my screen uh, to let's have a look. I hope this will work. Um, can you see, can everybody see the screen now? Yep. Yes, we can. We can see yeah. it. Yeah. Okay, great. So um, Becoming started as a um, sound, a radio uh, show, um, Sound Art Radio based in uh, Dartington. Well, is it still based in Dartington, Richard? Is that where the studio is? Yeah, it's still there. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, in Devon. Um, put out a call for radio shows that would explore, um, well, it was called Trans Tomorrow's Transmissions. So it was thinking about what we were learning through the pandemic and how we might begin to imagine a new world. I mean, there were, there were lots of these uh, small bids. I'm sure you probably were aware of them coming out at Little Arts Council funded bids. And a lot of them were thinking about, you know, what can we learn? What can we learn from what we're going through and how can we make things better? And um, so I was really struck as lots of people were, I think at the time of 
everything being very quiet and um, hearing more birdsong, um, seeing things going on that I wouldn't have usually maybe paid attention to or, or um, yeah, that there was something going on with my attention. Like I couldn't, I don't know how everybody else was faring, but I couldn't really read anything. My, um, the way my focus was, I could listen to lots of stuff, but I couldn't really take things in reading. Um, so I thought, great, I'll, I'll work with radio and put out a call to um, develop a series of shows on becoming. So thinking about becoming fungus, becoming plant, becoming insect, becoming bird, and then becoming animal. And uh, in including different ways of thinking about what, what it means to really be this thing, what it means to be a fungus. Um, so not just a mushroom, the fruiting body, but like the mycelial networks that are um, linking up all of the different fruiting bodies that are speaking to the plants, um, you know, the insects that are interacting with the plants, the birds that are interacting with the insects, like all of these different things, but really investigating, not just from a scientific perspective, but through lots of different creative lenses. Um, in an effort to sort of begin to inhabit or sort of, yeah, I think inhabit, whether it's sonically or through your body or through, um, through the facts that people like Merlin Sheldrake were telling us about how, how fung fungus develops and the different modes that it takes, different life forms. Um, and so anyway, so I put out this call and I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom. I hope this doesn't make everyone feel a bit ill looking at it. So in the first episode, it was Becoming Fungus. We had Merlin Sheldrake, Helen Moore, a poet, um, Sharon Keeveland, Angela Rawlings, Reese Trimble, Milena Popovnina, uh, except from some of my work, Amy Cutler's um, musical recordings, Stephen Emerson, Michael Prine, John Cage, and a great uh, reflection from a project by uh, Jeanne Mun uh, on the Bioremediation Project, um, which I think uh, was in, well, it's in the US, I can't remember exactly where it is, but using fungus to um, clean up oil spills. Um, and so anyway, we had all of these different pieces, whether it was performance work or sound work or poetry, um, and the thing that came up particularly with this that maybe set the tone for the rest of the project was translation and thinking about, um, uh, so I was particularly interested in what uh, Joe was saying about, you know, using modes of translation and understanding um, different modes that were coming up and the partiality of our perspective that we can only ever really understand it sort of in a fragmented way. And actually, I think that was the beauty of that came out in hopefully these episodes of um, the partiality of specialism and understanding of all of these different people and how they were thinking about fungus or plants or insects or, or um, birds or animals. Um, that, that kind of coming together, it creates this sort of chorus that can be, you know, sort of distonal or, you know, there could be some real dissonance and there can be lovely overlap and smooth run on from one thing to another. Um, but the thing that came out particularly was this idea of translation, whether it was physically translating. So I, many of you might have seen Merlin's, um, uh, he put spores of uh, the oyster mushroom in between each of his, the pages of his book and the oyster mushrooms grew out of the book, eating, digesting the book. And Michael Prime um, worked with him to record the sounds that such kind of digestion or kind of turning the sound of the oyster mushroom turning the book into itself eating the book um, but it was great because Stephen Emerson who whose work I was familiar with before either of uh, their works came out more recently he had already done that with the translations of Rilke and thinking about how mushrooms translate Rilke and then he'd eaten those fungus and then he'd actually sampled um, bottles of his urine and just I mean it sort of goes on you can put sort of urine back into the ground this continual process of metamorphosis of one thing moving into another thing um, so that was that was something that was really kind of uh, great that came up in this and that I think you know comes out in the different episodes 
Um, so this was the Becoming Plant one. They're all available on my on my website, Singing Apple Press. Um, Becoming Insect was very full. You can see from the um, from the list of contributors there. Um, and uh, Becoming Bird. My favourite, so the Becoming Bird and the Becoming Insect, because it's when I actually sort of began to be a little bit, I wouldn't say competent, but a little bit better at, at, at sort of audio editing. <laughs> Um, and then becoming animal was the final final one. Um, and so then this these um, these uh, kind of radio shows then developed into a residency that I did with um, Undergrowth, which is an um, arts organisation uh, based in Coventry. They very kindly invited me to uh, be their artist in residence, which I had to do remotely because I wasn't there. Um, obviously, we were all in lockdown, couldn't move around. And so I um, used this focus of becoming and I did a very, very um, sort of condensed, it was sort of five days and each day I focused on a different mode of becoming. So um, to begin with, it was becoming fungus, then becoming, uh, uh, what was it? Becoming fungus, becoming plant, becoming insect, becoming bird, becoming animal. And I really tried to incorporate that sense into myself, into my body. And so the first, um, the first day was um, just becoming fungus. So that was actually just purely performative. And then I, I wrote a few reflections. Um, I'll just show you that's available, the full kind of, um, oh, oh, great. Oh. Uh, well, it it's it is available. I'll share the link in the chat afterwards, um, and you can see the sort of diary that I did um, of each day and the process of going through each mode of becoming. Um, but what you can see in some of the the images here is the series of booklets that came out of it. So, um, becoming fungus was the first day. It was just purely performative. Becoming um, insect was the second becoming plant was the second day which you can see sort of down here and so for the from the second day onwards rather than being purely performance based I laid out a huge sheet of paper on the floor and I did really interesting to hear about your project Joe because I did exactly what you were talking about with your dancer really looking at the shapes of the two plants that I was working with which was celery and dandelion and I chose celery because we always think of plants being outside and um, of course plants are in our fridge a lot of the time so um, I was sort of trying to diversify a little bit and um, and so to look observing the plant really look at its structure thinking about the types of movements that it is both making and suggesting to the human body and then I moved on the paper with the plants and um, then broke up. I mean, you can sort of see the sort of fuller idea in some of the images of the um, of the becoming animal there. It was a big grid um, that I had uh, broken up with masking uh, tape. And then at the end of that kind of movement exploration, I wrote wrote some notes and um, made a series of booklets for each um each res kind of day long residency. So there's a booklet and series of an accompanying artwork that goes with each one. Um, according to my timer, I've got about sort of four minutes left. So I might come out of my stop screen sharing for a minute. Hello everybody, back again. Um, and uh, just show you some of the actual booklets so this is an example of the becoming insect what sort of came together so they then went out to I did 66 versions of, of this that were then sent out to um, across Coventry uh, for different I, I'm not sure how the, the pod actually decided who got the, the works but um, they were sent out and the idea was that in each of the booklets you would have obviously an artwork, a kind of trace of the process that I'd been through. 
but also a combination of both kind of poetry and prompts that that readers um, that the audience could then re-embody it themselves and make their own work. So I'll just read through um, the Become Insect booklet that, that um, kind of accompanied a, an artwork. Become Insect. Feel the soil in your skin. Feel the air in your wings. A plant is your playground. Insects are Earth's key workers, breaking down plants into soil, pollinating flowers to make fruit. Become insect. Search for an insect inside, outside, listen. What sound does it make? Look, how does it move? Become insect. Feel these movements in your body. Place your hands on the earth, wriggle your fingers in. How does it feel to move through the crumbling dark? Become insect. Um, so that's just a, a kind of sense of, of what these these different book works and artworks are each one this is a plant one with its accompanying booklet um, the animal trace one um, obviously each one as I said is different and um, this is an example of the of the of the bird one um, so well, it's been lovely because some of this work has gone into uh, not the physical work and the performance work, but the sound fragments have got are out in uh, Vienna at the moment in the Vienna Biennale, and um, we'll, I'll be developing some workshops uh, in the spring for um, using this becoming project. But um, more imminently, I'm planning on on uh, offering them out through a pa Patreon uh, scheme that I'm aiming to launch later on this month. Um, so yeah, I hope that has been vaguely clear, uh, but please do, if anyone has any connections with their projects or what they're doing um, with the radio works, with the sound movement um, workshop ideas, uh, we'd love to, I'd love to get to a point of sort of making big scale artworks and displaying them as well. Um, but yeah, if anybody wanted to uh, uh, comment or, or get involved or, or anything, uh, please do. So that's that's it from me, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Camilla. That was great. Uh, uh, you mentioned a few things along the way, which I've tried to put in the chat. Um, but I'll, I'll probably ask everyone, ask uh, all the today's sharers to uh, send me some links I can put onto the web page. But um, uh, Robin Harriet, uh, you had not so much questions or comment, but um, I thought I'd like to invite you in just to um, talk about what you said in the chat. Oh, hi. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Hi, Camilla. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, love the sound of this. I think I was just um, commenting in the chat about, um, I think when you were talking about the fungus, the fungi being fungus, um, and all these different levels of expression and embodiment, whether it's audio, visual, written in language, and I just find it's a really lovely illustration of the complexity of life. And we're never going to understand everybody or everything's language, but I like the way that, that your work is just offering a way into that and a way into, yeah, the bridges, I suppose, between different species and different forms of being. So I think that's what I was trying to say in a not very good way. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's kind of, a, I found it really overwhelming. I'm sure everybody working with this kind of stuff does, but you kind of start scratching the surface and there's just so, you know, obviously an hour long kind of radio show on what it is to be an insect. I haven't even specialized into like grasshopper or, you know, like ant. Um, there are just so many different ways of, of being, um, but 
you know, even just beginning to realize that the complexity and, uh, that is out there is, is helpful, I think. And yeah, and definitely. And offering a way in through your, the pieces that you've produced, those mm. prompts I felt were really accessible for a lot of people. So it's, it's really lovely. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's good to hear. I'm glad. I'm always, it's always difficult if you come from a kind of slightly strange hybrid arts uh, thing. People get sometimes a bit nervous about engaging with that kind of work. So accessibility can be a problem. So that's helpful. Thanks, Harriet. I, I was very struck by um, you starting to talk about in the early stretch throes of the work about sound as, an, as a form of embodiment. And mm. You know, a lot of your work is embodied. Uh, so I, I found that very interesting that you you were kind of framing it that way, consciously or not. But it was um, very much about a lot of the work you, you were doing was about and, and re-embodying different kinds of spaces and ideas. Mm. Um, if we've got, we've, got, we've got room for one more question, if anybody wants to uh, come in. Yeah, uh, Martin, you need to unmute yourself. There we uh, go. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I may have jumped in wrongly, but is, is it okay to just uh, address something to Mary, Mary Walton? Yeah, yeah, of oh, course. Yeah. Of course. It's just that I was doing some, well, <laughs> well, the last session was on, I was doing a little bit of research. <laughs> um, looking for the geology of um, Salborn. And um, I've come across uh, an article called Some Observations on Dew Ponds. And it was published in the Geographical Journal um, in 1909. Yes. But um, makes mention of um, Gilbert White and the natural history of Selborn and his yeah. comments on dew ponds. You've seen that, presumably. Yes, I have. And there was a huge, very heated discussion before the First World War about dew ponds and where did they come from. It's perfectly fascinating. <laughs> and it ended up, if you're into this stuff, with a very short article in the Manchester Guardian before it became the Guardian. Um, if you're interested, Richard, I can send you a copy of that. It's really quite fun. It's, you know, I've, people going going at it about how does a dew pond form. Yes, I would be interested in that. Fine. So do just ping me an email or something and I'll send it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for looking. Thanks for the interest. Anyone else like to come in as we head towards our close? Uh, I just wanted to shout out some of the con, um, uh, uh, contributors to, to uh, the Becoming series who are yes, here. Good. Susie David did a beautiful poem. Uh, <laughs> as far Susie as that. is waving. Yes, she's waving. And Tom Engate, his Apple Tree Orchestra was in there as well. Um, I was just having a look around. I hope I haven't. Oh, there we go, waving, lovely. <laughs> um, so I I'm, I'm feel like I hope I haven't missed anybody out. I'm just kind of scanning. But anyway, I just wanted to, to shout out some of the contributors. <laughs> right. Thank you, everybody, for today's session, which was, as usual, rich and informed. And I was really struck, actually, by one of the commonalities in the work, is that it was all... Uh, kind of deeply informed by another practice, whether that was scientific research or biology or actually living on the land um, or kind of inhabiting the spaces of other species. Um, uh, so, yeah, fantastic. So um, next month we are still here on Zoom and we have uh, Sophie Pierce, who's a writer who's talking about um, how she is using being in the natural world to deal with a particular uh, grief uh, and possibly one other contributor as well. Um, and then August, we're going to experiment with our hybrid form. So uh, it's great to have everybody here. We, as I say, we will add the chat and the, the video hopefully by Monday should be back up on the website. So do come back. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you everybody very much indeed for being with us today. 
and we'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Richard. Lovely to bye. see you. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. everybody. Bye. Take care.